tonight we have Rebecca Winthrop here. She's also a senior fellow at Brookings and director of the Center for Universal Education. And education is a topic we all love under the best of circumstances and even under the current situation we find us in. Rebecca's going to give us a, a look at, a, at the global situation, particularly in developing countries, very fragile nation states. You may actually leave here feeling better about our situation, <laughs> if that's uh, possible. Uh, let me also uh, in, invite you to contact us at any time with questions about events. Uh, Rebecca is going to speak for about 40 minutes and take some questions, so we'll plan on wrapping up about 6.30 or so. Uh, Rebecca also gave an interview on KNPR this morning that's uh, linked to on our website if you'd like to hear a little bit more about her research interests. And as always, we'll have these lectures up on our website uh, in a few days. So they'll, uh, Rebecca's will join the other 20 or so lectures that we've done if you'd like to catch up on anything that you happen to have missed. Rebecca? Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, it's great to be here, uh, and thanks for coming. I'm um, really pleased to be here because I grew up in Oregon. I'm a West Coaster. I personally love the West Coast. Any chance I can get to get west of the Mississippi, uh, I grab it. Um, and um, today I'm going to be talking about education in developing countries, uh, very specifically, and, and just out of pure curiosity for all of your backgrounds and, and interests, could you raise your hand if you've ever been to Africa? So several of you. Um, so that is something that I didn't get much of a chance to even think about education in developing countries when I was growing up and in my schooling in Oregon and um, it really wasn't until sort of after college that this broader world opened up to me um, and there certainly are a lot of parallels between education in developing countries as well as um, education problems and challenges and innovative solutions that uh, all of you are working uh, on so hard, um, both here in Las Vegas and, and here in the U.S. Um, one of my uh, sort of main purposes is to give you a context and, and a background of, you know, what is the developing world if it's not a place? I think several of you have been there and probably know quite a bit about it, for, but for those of you who don't, what is the context we're talking about? And then what is the story of education in the developing world? Um, and most importantly, lastly, the third thing I really want to focus on is uh, what, um, what should, should, or rather why, why should we as Americans uh, care about educational attainment in other countries? Why would it matter to us while we're you know, focusing so much on um, our own education systems? Uh, so first and foremost, just to give a little bit of a background, when we talk about the developing world, there's all sorts of different ways to cut the pie and to think about what includes the developing world. One way to um, think about it is to look at poverty levels. There are uh, the World Bank has a, has a metric, has a measure of uh, people living on less than $1.25 a day live in what is defined as extreme poverty. Uh, and you can see that the bulk of that, of, well, the, the dark red and the bright red and the, and the oranges are really where the, the highest um, number of people living on less than $1.25 a day are located, which you can see is largely what we would is largely Africa and some parts of South Asia, et cetera. Um, so that's, you know, what one way we, we measure um, the idea of the developing world and where the, the poorest nations are. are. Are where there's lowest, you know, us and Canada and Europe and Russia and stuff and Australia are where there's less than 2% of the population live on um, less than $1.25 a day. Uh, so we would probably call that the developed world or rich nations, poor nations. World Bank term is high income countries and low income countries. Um, and adi in addition to sort of income levels, there's other things that characterize the developing world, such as health indicators, you know, what it's like to live there. One specific um, indicator that 
uh, people use a lot is infant mortality. <clears throat> so how many babies die, basically? Um, and this is a chart that shows um, for every thousand babies born, how many die usually before they reach age one. And in developed countries, like the country where, where we are, it's about five in a thousand, but you can see in the developing world it's huge, 45 per thousand, which as a new mother is extremely scary to me, just the thought of that. Um, another instant sort of data point that gives you a sense of comparison that I don't have a chart for, but is um, life expectancy. So what's the average, you know, sort of life expectancy? How long are people on average thought to live? Um, and it's very different, as you can imagine, for these poor countries and these rich countries. What do you guys think is the life expectancy in the US? Maybe someone knows it offhand. Just take a guess, if you don't. 78, bingo, 78.4 years. You must have known that. <laughs> no? <laughs> yes, yes, clearly. Um, what do you think the life expectancy is in Sierra Leone? It's a country in West Africa. Someone said it, 45. Did someone say 45? Yeah, well, very close, 47.6 years old. So, you know, if I lived in Sierra Leone, on average, I would be nearing the last decade of my life, which is also frightening for me to think about. Um, uh, so again, in addition to poverty rates, there's real differences in health outcomes and, and life expectancies and, and ability just to survive. Another um, sort of summary of some of the major challenges that developing countries face are listed here, and you can just, I'll give you a moment just to go ahead and, and read. When we talk about um, child labor, which is this first one here, 150 million kids involved in child labor. Child labor, there's very clear definitions of what are child work and child labor. So child labor is not um, your babysitting for your little brother and sister. It's really work that kids are involved in that are hazardous to their health, their well-being, could, could injure or harm them deeply, physically and, and or mentally. Um, in terms of the next one, 18 million children living with effects of displace, displacement, which is con kind of an odd term, these are refugees. Refugees or people who have been displaced within their own country, which are called internally displaced people. They're not actually classified under international law as refugees. Um, in terms of maternal, risk of maternal death, I mean, that one's pretty clear. So. Um, the worst country in the world, or at least the last time I looked, for, for maternal mortality, so women dying and, you know, while giving childbirth. Um, a, what, what do you think it is, and what do you think the incidence is? Any guesses? Continental country. What's that? Continental country. Continental mean the, meaning what? Oh, I don't care. You can throw out anything at this, this moment. I, I wouldn't have known this except I read it like last year. Yeah, and it's stuck in my mind. <laughs> Haiti. Haiti, no. Though, I, though it could have surpassed recently. I, I'm not sure. Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone, pretty close. Pretty close. Ethiopia. Close again. It's Niger. Again, in Africa, one in seven women die in childbirth which is, you know, again, as a recent mother, that I was like, oh my God, that's just, just so horrific to put yourself in that position to think about what your life must be like if those are the odds you're faced with if you're trying to continue your family and community um, and being a woman in these countries. So anyways, life, life is tough in many respects, but, you know, for, for plenty of people, for all of you who visited these places or lived in these in different parts of the world, you know, these are very depressing statistics, they're real statistics, but that's certainly, you know, if you meet people in, in developing countries, they're not depressed people or depressing people. They're, for the most part, um, wonderful and warm and have, you know, wonderful extended families. Um, everyone was always very horrified until very recently that I didn't have any children. They thought it was such a tragic, tragic loss and what was I doing with my life? Um, sounded like my mother, but um, uh, 
you know, it, it, it's, it's a very, there's many good, good qualities. And in fact, um, a colleague of mine, Carol Graham, this is a bit of an aside, she does work on happiness. She's a colleague at Brookings. Uh, and she has done all these happiness surveys around the world and found that actually people in places like Afghanistan are pretty happy. Um, in fact, they're 20 times more likely to smile in a day than pe people in other Latin American countries. So just because life is very grim in, in, in reality, it doesn't mean people themselves are grim. Uh, the human spirit is, is pretty impressive. Um, one thing that could be another feature of the developing world that could be either um, very depressing or very hopeful, largely depending on uh, what educational opportunities exist, are how young and how youthful the developing world is. So here you see youth demographic map. Um, so this is a map of the median age of the world for the most part. Uh, and you'll see that the yellows, the median age is between 14 and 20, which is really young. Um, the light pinks between 20 and 25. So, you know, and the oranges. So you'll see that the, you know, really young, young, the continent of Africa is a, is a young continent, as well as a lot of places in, in sort of South Asia and a bit here, too. Um, the, just to give you one example, half the population in Pakistan is under the age of 17. So, you know, this, these are very young, youthful countries. Um, a lot of old people up here in Canada, that's a bunch of old people up there, as well as in some some parts and of course the US is, is also our median age is much much higher um, than a lot of the, the world. Um, so that's really a very sort of brief overview to give people a sense of you know what do we mean when we the context what do we mean when we talk about developing world. Um, and now the question I want to really turn to is really about education. What's the story about education in the developing world? What are the basic Challenge, biggest challenges, biggest needs. There is um, some good rankings and statistics that we who work on education in, in the global arena use a lot. <clears throat> One is called the Education Development Index. It's put out by the United Nations, a United Nations organization called UNESCO. Uh, and you'll see, not every single country, you won't see the U.S. listed here because they didn't actually fill out the survey and send it back to UNESCO to be ranked, and many other countries are missing too. Um, but you'll you'll see that the sort of this is a listing of the highest um, people in the Education Development Index, and and the index is really made up up of a couple of variables. Here, total primary NER, which is net enrollment rate, just means how many kids are um, of school age and enrolled in elementary school. This one, adult literacy rates, how many adults can read and write. This one here is how many girls and boys. Are there equal number of girls and boys enrolled uh, in school or not? Um, there's, never, there's never been more. These are all almost equal number of girls to boys. It's very rarely the other way around. Um, survival rates to grade five, what that means is just do kids stay in school till grade five. So you see that all the countries here largely, more or less, are sort of European countries. You've got Korea down here, et cetera. Um, and, and they're the ones that are sort of, you know, doing the best uh, globally. Of course, there's many countries missing um, who are not in the index. Um, but they're the ones who have not only older populations, but uh, are, are, are much, much wealthier. And the low education, these are sort of the bottom tranche of, of countries on the Education Development Index. And you'll see here that, you know, you've got Nicaragua there, but pretty much everything else is more or less in Africa. Um, and you've got Iraq here, which is not a poor country, um, you know, by World Bank standards. Um, but of course, they've gone through a lot of conflict and war. So that reduces their, their um, educational status. Um, and in fact, um, Conflict is one of the things that um, particularly impacts the ability of countries to ad have advanced education systems or to advance their educational attainment of their, of their um, populations and their children and their youth. Close, there's about 70 million kids out of school in the world today, out of, out of primary school. 
an equal number um, out, of, out of sort of secondary school, what we would call high school. Um, and of those 70 million kids, half of them live in conflict-affected countries. So it's a really um, big uh, problem, <laughs> problem for many reasons. Um, so you'll see here most of the countries affected by conflict um, are, again, in Africa, in sort of South Asia, around there. Of course, there's Colombia and Haiti there representing Latin America and our hemisphere. Um, so that, that is a, you know, a, a very difficult problem. Another difficult problem um, is, let's see, out of school youth. A lot more kids are in, are in elementary school and very, very few kids make it to secondary school. Um, you know, it's just on, on average you probably some countries in Africa are getting much more closer to having all their kids enrolled in school. There's still, you know, percentages, dep totally depends on the country of kids who don't enroll even in elementary school or what we would call primary school. And then it just, if you average it, it just plummets to like 20, 30 percent of kids actually make it on to secondary school or to high school. Um, and here again, you see that out of school youth, you know, the, the purple and the blue um, are, are the biggest, the, the dark blue, I guess, or light blue, or I'm not sure, turquoisey blue, here are the biggest um, uh, areas that uh, represent out-of-school youth. And of course, they have younger populations, so that's part of it, but um, uh, they also sort of coincide with that sub-Saharan Africa, South and West Asia uh, nexus that we've been looking at. Now, the real question, the policy question that we're particularly interested in at Brookings um, is, you know, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Do um, poverty and conflict lead to poor educational attainment or does poor educational attainment uh, really have a hand in fostering poverty and, and conflict? Um, and this has really important policy implications in terms of what our policies, what we can actually do about these things. Um, and of course, I think, you know, the, the answer is that um, both, uh, both sets of relationships uh, exist. And in terms of um, poverty and conflict holding back educational processes, uh, not processes, progress, uh, there is a whole sort of litany of ways in which that happens, um, and I'll run through um, I'll run through a couple. Um, first, there is um, lots massive teacher shortages in the developing world. Uh, the world we need about nine million more teachers, primary school for all kids to enroll. If we want every single child to get an elementary primary education, uh, we need nine million more primary school teachers. And believe me, there's not nine million teachers sitting in teacher training institutes waiting to graduate for those jobs. So even if countries had money to hire them, there are really uh, very few teachers in the pipeline. This is a typical classroom, by the way, uh, probably in Africa or, or some countries in Asia where you know it's cement and, and the blackboard is, is um, built into the wall and, and just local, locally, that's sort of a, you know, that's a, they sit on the low part and write on the high part, sort of a desk uh, that's made with a window um, cracked open in the concrete. There's also um, really difficult data management uh, systems. I'm not sure where this picture came from, actually. My research assistant dug this up. I don't know really what's, what it's of, but I like the concept of, you know, hopefully in education uh, ministries in developing countries, there would be a desk with an old computer, probably, and some sort of files keeping track of um, students and what grades uh, are, are uh, full or not, or where schools need to be built and who's graduating, etc. But management of education systems is really hard in these countries. A lot of times people, ministries of education don't even have computers. They don't, I mean, how they keep track of things is, you know, oftentimes they don't, but it's really difficult. I um, worked a lot in Afghanistan several years ago and I um, visited, right after the fall of the Taliban, I, I visited the country and was working on setting up education programs and I went to the Ministry of Education which runs education for the whole country and the 
building was totally bombed out. The minister was, had his window bombed out, and he was sitting freezing in his coat and his hat, and he, you know, we had a nice talk, and he went searching for a piece of paper and a pencil. I mean, they really had nothing. And I came back a year later or a year and a half later, and, and they'd progressed tremendously. They'd gotten some windows in and a little space heater, and they'd gotten some pads of pens and paper. Um, and then I was asking, well, how are you doing? What's your educational status? How many kids are in school? How many kids are not? How many schools do you need to be built? He, he, he was really pleased. He said, we've started a fantastic um, data management system. We're really getting a handle on this. And he pulled out this big, huge, sort of literally the paper was like that big. I don't know where they got this huge paper. Um, stack of papers that had little numbers written on it all, all the way down. He had developed a system of tracking all the students in the entire country by hand. He'd asked each teacher to fill in by hand, and they gave them to the principal, and the principal would add them up and send it to the district person, and the district would add it up and send it to the central person. And that's how they tried to figure out how, where did they need to build the schools, how did they, you know, how girls, how many girls, how many boys, did they need more female teachers, where were going to get them from? But you can imagine the massive amounts of time that took, and that was just to get some basic, probably semi-inaccurate data. So it's a, it's a really very difficult problem. Um, another thing, of course, is uh, limited lack of textbooks. Uh, here's a typical sort of classroom. Students don't have textbooks to take home with them to study um, in, in after school, um, but they do have a few textbooks to, to use in the school, and one in one country, um, uh, one region of Kenya that I visited in the north, there were there's one textbook for every 20 students. So I mean, how how you're able to learn um, is, is like that is you know as you can imagine, it's very difficult. High pupil teacher ratios, of course, directly related to our teacher shortage problem. Again, another typical um, example: classes are really um, packed uh, in Africa. 50 teacher, 50 students to one teacher is pretty standard. I've been in many classrooms that have 100 kids to one teacher, um, which, I mean, if you've ever been in a classroom, it's really very difficult to teach. But kids are motivated. Those boys at the back, they will stand there the entire day, probably, and, and, and uh, do the best they can to, you see this, this kid is writing as best he can, trying to take notes in the, in the margins there. Um, there's very few, um, often schools don't have clean, don't have water for students to drink or bathrooms to use, which can be, um, as you can imagine, hard, and especially for girls, especially adolescent girls, when they start menstruation, they often just can't go to school that week, um, which leads them to get farther and farther behind and, and, and often drop out. Again, another very typical school. There's no school structure, but this is a village. They want to have some, some learning going on. They sit under a tree. It's hard when the wind blows, the papers fly away, but they, they persist and make do. Um, long distances to school. Um, in West Africa, it's pretty common. 70% of the population uh, of the students, I would say, the, the kids walk more than three kilometers um, to get to school. How much is that in miles? Is that like two miles? Three? Yeah. OK. So far, for those of you who don't operate in kilometers. Um, again, lots of very, you know, another typical school. That's a cute kid. Here's a refugee camp. Uh, this is a typical refugee camp. Some are there longer and end up having more stable structures. But these are what, where people are living. These are all little houses. This is what the UN passes out, this plastic sheeting when people come fleeing across, across a border. Um, and again, there are schools in there, I think. If I'm not mistaken, one of these might be a school, actually. So you can imagine, difficult context in which to try to continue learning. But on the other hand, on the other set of relationship, and this is the story that's told much less frequently, and to me, this is the story that has really powerful policy implications um, for all of us, which is, you know, education does have a very important role to play in combating poverty and reducing the risk of conflict. Um, and this is one of the reasons um, that we need to think about 
uh, education in developing countries very seriously in our country. Why we, it's actually in a, you know, directly relevant to us here in the U.S. Despite all of our worries and, and um, well-founded, um, our own well-founded problems um, and concerns with our own education systems. So first, uh, education, especially a quality education, um, is one of the most important drivers of economic growth in these poor countries, in these developing countries around the world. There's really good evidence to, to show um, that there's a very strong causal relationship between um, uh, countries that have good scores on math and science are, are as one proxy indicator, we would call it, um, are, are countries that, that prosper economically and that helps drive growth. This is certainly one of the factors that um, helps spur growth among the, the Asian tigers, um, the countries in, in Asia that have, you know, prospered over the last several decades. Also, um, that growth in and reduction of poverty and um, in poor countries and developing countries is also a really important source of our U.S. growth economically. Um, the the biggest trading partners that the U.S. has are in emerging markets, and most of the emerging markets are really in these poor countries that we've talked about, these developing nations. And the more those countries. Um, get an educated population and can lift themselves out of poverty. That becomes uh, a much greater expanded market for U.S. goods and services um, and is, is an important way for, for us to um, uh, get ourselves out of, out of um, economic distress as well. Another reason that, that we should care is that there is now emerging data that's pretty good um, that education has an important role to play. It's Certainly not the only factor. There's many factors, especially you know political um, issues. But education has an important role to play um, in increasing security and maintaining peace and um, decreasing the incidence of, of conflict. Um, particularly if it's a if it's a quality education, if it's a, a relevant education. Um, there are some studies that say that um, an increase in one year of the average schooling of a population is um, estimated to reduce the risk of civil war by 3.6%. And there's been a range of other studies that have come up with some of these similar types of findings. Um, there's also seems to be an emerging consensus uh, around um, getting boys into high school the, the, when the more boys are, who are in high school in these, in these countries, conflicts tend to last much, much shorter. Um, the duration of conflict reduces. Um, and it's, it's important to note that it's not just the amount of time people spend in school, but it's the quality of that education. You know, education in many countries is very linked to national ideology, to who we are as citizens, how we view um, others in the world. Uh, and there certainly are contexts of, of education that has a curriculum and, and or teaching and pedagogy that really foments intolerance and, and not accepting others and, and can exacerbate friction. So it's important to note that you, know, you need to have a quality education as well as a relevant education. Um, there, you know, youth unemployment is a big factor in, in instability. We're seeing some of that in Egypt right now. And, and so you need to have an education that gives young people the skills they need to translate that into jobs. So um, it is an important, again, um, concern when we think about conflict risk and reducing conflict risk, which of course um, is something we're very concerned with here in the U.S. in terms of our national security debate. It also um, can produce uh, very big and important effects on health um, in developing countries. You know, if you talk to anybody who works on sort of global health or health in developing countries, they'll say, you know, we know that the best thing to do that has the biggest impact to improve health outcomes is girls' education. Of course, you also need to improve clinics and medicines and vaccines and all sorts of things, but that in terms of numbers-wise, girls' education, especially if they can reach, get the kind of skills um, and knowledge and, and critical thinking and problem solving that comes with higher education, or when I say higher in this context, I mean high school, 
not the university. So if you can get girls through elementary school into high school, you have really big impacts. They have much less incidences of maternal mortality, so they, they don't die in childbirth as much. This is often because they're much more empowered to say, hey, I'm not feeling well, get me to the clinic, you take me, you know, et cetera. They uh, have much healthier kids, so infant mortality reduces. Um, and in fact, they, when their livelihoods, um, their skills, they invest back in the community. So there's great, gr lots of very, it's a pretty good consensus in the literature that um, uh, community development and, and local community empowerment is definitely spurred forward um, by investing in girls' secondary education. So if those reasons aren't enough for you, um, of course, there's the moral argument that, um, you know, I think everyone should subscribe to, not everyone does, but the fact that, you know, it's also the right thing to do. We should care about um, the educational status of kids in the developing world. It's a basic fundamental human right. It's, it's not fair, nor is it right or just, that just because these kids are, are born where they're born, um, and it means that they're allotted such a, a difficult path and, and limited opportunities. Um, so given that what I would say education has a pretty central role to um, improving our global community and uh, is of deep interest not only to poor countries themselves but to us in the developed uh, world, um, what has the global community done about education around the world? Um, can anybody think of a few things? Any ideas? What do you think the global community has done? Could be anything. Thrown money at it? Yes, but not enough. <laughs> Build schools, yep. Send teachers, yep. So these are all, you guys are naming all sorts of things that definitely happen and that fall under um, uh, which is frankly a recent, um, a recent last sort of, you know, couple decades um, perspective that, that education should be um, important. And of course, you probably all know about the human rights, human rights to education. There's many instruments of international human rights. These are two that talk specifically about, about the fact that everyone has a right to an education. This one, Education for All, um, the, it's, it's a global movement of um, education ministers all around the world. And 20 years ago, they gathered in Thailand, uh, and they all agreed, and, and it was people from developed countries, rich countries, as well as poor countries, saying, you know what, the status of education is really terrible, but we know we, it's in everyone's best collected interest if we improve it. Um, and so they, there was this compact, this global compact between rich countries and poor countries, developed and developing countries. And um, the poor countries said, you know, we promised to come up with really strong plans to how to advance education in our country. And the rich countries said, okay, we'll promise to fund you, you know, give you the whatever missing money. So you come up with whatever funds and whatever you need to, to implement those plans, whatever is missing will, will, will not go unfunded, which of course totally didn't happen. But it happened a little bit, and it's been happening. Um, and so that's um, one important aspect of what the global education, uh, the global community did. And they, they laid out eight goals, on eight really specific goals on, and I can tell you what they are later, um, if you're interested on what you know, we should focus on in terms of improving education. And two of those goals were picked up in the Millennium Development Goals. And this has been, in 2000, the UN system and really the global community altogether said, you know what, we want to really harness all our efforts and focus on a couple things over the next sort of 15 years. A lot of the, they set themselves the deadline of 2015 um, to really achieve some progress in some really fundamental important areas. And two of the six goals are on education. One is um, that all kids should enroll in primary school, enroll in complete primary school, and that the second goal is that girls and boys should do that in equal numbers. Pretty, you know, basic, <laughs> you would think. Um, and actually, uh, this has been a pretty good news story in international development. Um, there was, at the time, um, you know, millions and millions more kids out of school. So, 
Um, there were 110 million kids, and, and today there's about 70 million kids out of school. In five years, it's projected that there's still going to be 50 million kids out of school, so it's not, we're not going to meet the target globally, but um, it, it's actually one of the, the education goals is one of the Millennium Development Goals that has made the most progress. Um, so it does, it, it does show actually that if you concentrate and invest and focus, um, you can make progress um, in international development. Um, but what we're facing now, which is not something that we in the global education community really knew and I, at the time, and it's emerged, um, is that the assumption that if you get kids into school, they will learn something. Um, it probably sounds familiar to some of the debates we're having here in the States. Um, and they're really, what we've learned now is, is there really is a global learning crisis and we need to think very strongly um, about shifting the paradigm in the, in the global community um, to focus on this. Um, and, and the global learning crisis I, I define, this is a Brookings definition, um, has sort of three dimensions. First, of course, there's all the kids who are still out of school who have no access to learning opportunities. And mainly those kids are um, girls who live in rural areas, who are part of an ethno-linguistic minority or live in conflict. The second um, part of the learning crisis is that kids, especially in the early grades, are not learning the fundamental foundational skills they need. And the third part is that a lot of um, kids who do go on and are able to you know, master basic foundational skills um, are not learning relevant skills to the job market. And here's just one chart while we finish up. This just shows you, um, this is a, a chart showing percentage of students who could not read a single word as they enter third grade. So in, you'll see um, several countries li listed twice in different languages, so it's not just a mother tongue issue. Um, but you know, from 90% to 50% of kids can't recognize a single word. So basically kids are really not learning to read in these contexts, which is a foundational skill for further, further um, development. So it, it really is a, a serious crisis. Luckily, there are um, lots of things upon which we can build uh, a paradigm shift. Um, first of all, students in these countries are some of the most motivated kids to learn I have ever seen anywhere. Um, they are completely committed, sitting for hours at a time, even if the teacher doesn't show up, they've practiced amongst themselves. Um, leaders who are starting to realize that learning is a really important issue. And parents, especially in these countries, invest huge sums. In Haiti, they invest half their, on average, half their annual income in educating their kids, um, which is massive, and Haiti isn't alone. So there's huge motivation on the parts of parents and communities. Um, and I would say that slowly, slowly, people in rich countries, donors who help fund, you know, part of this global compact are beginning to learn that, that and realize that learning, there is a learning crisis and they need to adapt their strategies. Um, so that, the learning crisis is certainly something we're working on at Brookings. Um, and I think I'll stop there because I think we want to make sure that we have um, a good 20 minutes for, for questions. So I'll open it up. Yeah. Where do you get the teachers from? I mean, some of the villages I've been in, they have local teachers, but they're figuring, figuring with the students, maybe they teach them black magic, you know? Uh -huh. So how do, you, how do you establish the teacher at a certain level? Where do you get that? Yeah, well, to be honest, the, the data I've seen shows that actually local teachers, even though they're not trained, because you're right, there's teachers who are profoundly unprepared to be teachers. But a lot of the teachers who are from local communities, because oftentimes teachers will, if they're trained, they, they go, have to go to a in-service teacher training college so they don't get trained on the, on, you know, while they're teaching in schools, they have to leave the teaching profession and go um, to like a two or a four year teacher training college in the capital and then they become certified and then the government sends them around the country and they probably don't live in the um, village or community where they grew up. So those teachers are, are perhaps better, but also they have less accountability to the community. So they're absent more often. They're also, you know, more highly trained, so can do, you know, second and third jobs to make money because teacher salaries are really low. So 
I think actually what you said is, is actually part of the solution is if we can train in service local teachers, um, that would be a huge benefit for getting some of these teachers because there are not nine million teachers sitting in teacher training colleges ready to graduate who are well prepared. And there's some interesting programs. Um, the Open University is an organization um, that's done a program on distance education with teachers because we know that the number of teacher training colleges just don't provide, our, we just don't have the pipeline or capacity to train the teachers we need. So they're doing sort of interesting things with mobile phones and various other things to train teachers and bring them up to speed. Like you said, a lot of teachers need basic content refreshing, right? Basic math, basic, <laughs> you know, literacy, numeracy stuff that they can teach correctly. Yeah, yeah. Is your assessment of the effectiveness of non-governmental organizations? churches, service mm -hmm. clubs, and others uh, who seem to be doing some of the same kind of work in these areas. Are they more effective or less effective than governmental entities? And are they less or more affected by corruption, which mm -hmm. may be where some of the educational money ends up mm -hmm. before it ever gets down to the village? The school. classroom, right? The classroom. Yeah. So. so I used to um, work in NGOs. Um, so I uh, have a lot of firsthand experience in that. and I. I would classify N NGOs in sort of three, well, maybe two categories. I, there's a bunch of what I would call professional organiz non-governmental organizations where the people who are working in there and the strategies they're working on are very sophisticated. It's their careers. They've gone to school for it. They're professionals. Um, and though, you know, like Save the Children and Care and, you know, various other NGOs that I'm sure we would have all heard of. And, and they're essential, especially in conflict countries where there's practically no government often. Um, they're the first on the ground. They're essential to sort of ensuring services are done. Um, and, and they can be quite good. Uh, the only problem there is as much as they try, their incentive structure is not to necessarily um, build up the local NGOs because they get, you know, NGOs, these NGOs survive on big grants, right? They get grants from government actors or foundations to, to do work. And so it, they, you know, there is a habit of not working themselves out of a job as best they could. Then there's a whole set of what I think are really fantastic um, but mixed, qual mixed effectiveness, um, NG what I would call NGOs, which are um, communities who are involved in church networks or faith-based groups or local initiatives that aren't necessarily professionals. So they, you know, all the people investing and contributing probably have other jobs and are doing this on the side and maybe take um, service trips to go back and forth. And I've seen some fantastic work in those contexts. I've also seen some really bad work in those contexts, not because people meant it to be bad, but because they just didn't have the training, especially in places like conflict or fragile states. I had to rescue a church group once. I was in, in, in eastern Sudan, and they were driving along in a landmine area with no you're supposed to have, anyways, it was terrible. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't have a map. They had no, you know, they just had volunteered and they'd sent people to deliver medicines. And they, you know, all their medicines there had expired because they couldn't keep them cold enough. So you find that, um, which is scary, um, both, for the pe both for the people who volunteer, but also for, you know, the fact that, that those medicines could get into villagers' hands and be used. But you know, there's also a ton of great work going on. The corruption issue. Well, um, are NGOs less corrupt? Probably. I, I think probably. I mean, corruption. You know, I get that question a lot. And frankly, um, you know, it, it was worse than corruption because corruption is you know people really trying to take stuff and and and. Um, you know, that doesn't belong to them, et cetera. And that happens, and that happens a lot. But I wouldn't say it happens, you know, any more in higher volumes or, or larger incidents than it happens here in the U.S. We've had Abramoff and all these things, you know, so it happens everywhere in the world. But the, the larger problem, frankly, is lack of good governance structures. It's sort of governments just not having the capacity, whether it's because they have 
data based on sheets. They just can't quite get their act together to figure out how to get the textbooks from here to the village over there. They don't know how to do it. They don't have the trucks. They, the managers don't have the skills, that type of a thing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes me wonder kind of about the, uh, the global commitment to education. Okay. Um, it doesn't seem like necessarily there's uh, the kind of commitment that people would like to see. So NGOs and other you know, come in and okay. try and rectify the situation you know, to the degree that they're able to. But overall, it seems like uh, it's going to be very difficult for people to you know, move into global education in places like Afghanistan don't want to educate women, for example. Right. Or, you know, any number of conflicts. I mean, I lived in Thailand for a number of years, taught in the schools there. Um, and traditionally, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, temple would offer an awful lot of the education primary mm -hmm. grades. And so when Western forms of education came in, a lot of that got disrupted. And I don't think it necessarily got to a better state than yeah. it had been previously. You know? So there's a lot of different elements. Yeah, no, it is. It's complicated. And you bring up the question of sort of, um, cultural relevance, and a lot of times international development aid has been criticized as sort of neo-colonialism, and I think that that is true in some in some instances. And I don't think it's it's all, I don't think it's um, by intent. Having spent walked the halls of these the World Bank and various other institutions who get accused of this, I don't think the people in it who are designing these programs mean to do that. But there is a big power differential. So the World Bank shows up to a country and says, "Hi, you know, we of course want to support your plans. Tell us what your plans are." And they say the plan. They think, "Oh, that's total crap. You can, you can't do that. Are you kidding me?" And by the way, we have you know 500 million dollars if you want to do it our way. So, you know, there it's not by intent. But you know, there's a little bit of um, arrogance, perhaps, and so you know, they're tr the World Bank now. I'm picking on the World Bank. They actually do a lot of good work. Has is much better at sort of listening to communities, figuring out what's relevant, important, what's working. Don't mess up what's working. Supplement, etc. But there still is a lot of that. Was there anybody over here that I missed? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm really curious about this uh, concept that uh, that. Uh, Education reduces conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, we consider that the United States is a fairly educated country, but we've caused probably a hundred conflicts, s serious conflicts yeah. in the last hundred years, uh, in a hundred different countries, I should say. Yeah. And uh, how how do you reconcile how do we that? Square that? Is, it, is there anything about the content of the education? Well, What's going on? Yeah, that's a very good question. Question. Um, and I should have specified, all the research that this is emerging from is talking about reducing civil war. It's not we're talking about people invading others or you know, causing war outside of their borders. So you know, most of the conflicts in the world today are, are, are civil wars, are, in, are internal. Um, they're, they're not necessarily interstate between countries like you know, World War I, World War II, et cetera. Um, so that's the difference. So the data, so you know, your, your theory could potentially be right, um, that it doesn't, the ed education doesn't reduce sort of conflict making, um, but the data really looks at civil wars. And it's because, you know, if you have a really um, uh, sort of elite education system that marginalizes whole populations, that just further inflames um, how aggravated and pissed people get um, uh, and can exacerbate the, the tensions. Did you have a follow-up? No. Yeah. But even the civil wars, in many cases, are caused by these educated countries operating. Tunisia, for example. How, it, how is Tunisia caused by? Well, it, it, the basic issue there is the, uh, the uh, government is receiving support from the United States. Right. It's, it's created well, same by with, the United Same with States Egypt, and, right? What? Same in, with Egypt. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, no, and if you go through every country, every yeah. country you'll see behind the scenes, the, uh, today, in the last 50 years, the United States government. Yeah, well, that, that is really a very separate question, separate body of research. It's definitely true that the political dynamics in a country um, have a huge role to play. I mean, the fact that the U.S. has supported Egypt's leader for many, many years, invested in its military, etc., um, has a very important role to play in a lot of things. Um, 
But the, the data on education and civil war, it really looks at, I'll give you the example of, Kos of um, Kosovo. Um, before Kosovo was a, was a, a separate country, um, while it was under Serbia, they had an education system which outlawed um, the use of the Albanian language, which was Kosovar, Al you know, Albanians, they spoke Co Albanian. Um, co you couldn't learn any Albanian history. Um, in fact, you could, and then they had a whole list of things. You couldn't attend at certain periods of time. So basically what happened is, is you know, the, the Kosovar Albanians were oppressed, and education was really used as a tool to enforce that oppression. Um, and there ended up being, you know, a whole sort of parallel underground education system before the war broke out. Um, and so education itself, you know, there's nothing inherently right or wrong, I mean, you know, inflammatory, it's how it's used and how it's manipulated. They can either inflame or, you know, you have opposite examples of, of countries that have, you know, really dicey um, um, relationships that have education systems that have multiple languages, teach multiple histories, try to reach out to, to marginalized areas, and it can really reduce tensions, mitigate, so that's, that's what the research is. There was someone over here, yes. But to use the analogy, it seems like the, um, the boat is sinking really fast because we have a huge number of people under the age of 20 <laughs> coming into childbearing bearing age that are going to have children. So the problem isn't what you define. The problem is five times, six times, seven times that large in Absolutely. the next 10 years. How many kids are going to be born? You have a billion babies coming into this world. Exactly. Yeah. So, so what... You know, the Brookings Institute, you're, you're, you know, highly regarded. Is the solution that we're just going to have some NGOs or we're going to spend a few <laughs> dollars and try to, try to, you know, give this, these kids a teacher? Right. Isn't, isn't the problem, doesn't it require radical attempts to, as opposed to sort of, Sort of yeah, we'll get playing around the edges. We'll get one teacher in front of another 50 students, and that would be the solution. Because we don't have, if it's 10 million we need today, it's 20 million mm -hmm. teachers we need within the next five, 10 years. Yeah. So what, yeah. anyway, what I'm Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, and, and I think you're spot on in terms of assessing what is the scope of the problem. And there's a couple of, of sort of ways to, to look at potential solutions, and they kind of have to go hand in hand. One is to really try to ramp up um, global giving. And I'm not talking about how much an NGO or, or church groups, because those are really important, but they're very small in size. But I'm talking about, you know, there, we only need $16 billion to get every last kid in, school, in elementary school today. We'll need more. And that's a lot of money, but the amount of money that floats, you know, that's probably a couple days profit for Goldman Sachs or something, I'm not sure. But um, the, there's a, a, you know, how do you get um, some of the money floating around the world today um, into that solution from externally, from, from the global economy? So one thing would be to really pressure um, uh, developed countries' governments to prioritize education which frankly it hasn't been prioritized in the last couple of years. It used to be prioritized a couple of years ago and now there's been new administrations changing and it's, it isn't a really a big priority of anybody except for the, for the British, I think. Um, then there's a lot of people working on trying to figure out, um, you know, sort of a global transaction tax on, on fi financial services or whatever. Yeah, money is one. Another, uh, external money. Um, another, but basically external money is not going to solve everything. Most of the money and support comes from the countries themselves. So another is really trying to figure out um, how do you support the capacity of those governments to do their job better and to reach these, these kids. And then a third is sort of technical strategies. There's a lot of people working on um, thinking about, you know, we shouldn't focus just on schooling. Let's just focus on, you know, let's get every kid reading by, this is a new thing for USAID. This is, let's get every kid reading um, by, I don't know, 2020. And it, it could be through a school, it could not be through a school. It could be through a mobile phone. There's great sort of mobile phone pilots in Pakistan that have showed kids can really learn to, to basic literacy. So totally non-school based lateral stra education strategies that can reach massively more people. So I 
I definitely agree with you. Uh, as you talked about it, and so you showed us statistics coming down, you know, 30%, frankly, in eight years is not a bad, is not a bad statistic. How much, though, do you start bumping into the caste system or the religious issues? I mean, to get the 100% you're talking about, where, where is that, or are you already factoring that in as those are out as far as 100% goes? No, no, they're definitely not out. Um, and and the, the way the global education community talks about it is sort of um, the last the last 20 percent. So the kids who are not in school, let's just take primary school, elementary school, um, it's less often less, religion might play a role in it, but it's less about that. It's actually if you look at all the data, the kids who are by and large out of school around the world are, are girls, not just girls, there's plenty of wealthy and middle income, you know, middle income in comparative terms, you know, um, in those countries, girls who are doing fine, but girls who are poor, who live in rural areas, who are part of an ethno-linguistic minority. So are there no percentages that are left out because of religious or, because, you know, I'm just trying to think Oh, no, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are, but that actually isn't the biggest. It's really gender, class, um, and, and um, uh, location. Rural urban is the huge divide in education. There's a ton of other subgroups there. There's child laborers. Who don't get any access to education. There's kids who get married early, or you know, there's whole. There are many sort of cultural practices, but those aren't the biggies. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, just again, the caste system. There's certain countries that are, or certain areas yes. of the world where they're going to say that's life. Oh, so how do you convince them? You're saying, no, oh, yeah, yeah. The, well. Identifying who is out of school and then getting them into school is a whole other ball game. I mean, there's a whole range of cultural barriers um, that people run up against. For sure, you mentioned the caste system, um, which is one, but there's many, many others. Um, but to be honest, I, I th you know, ev I worked in Afghanistan um, for quite some time, and um, even people who were members of the Taliban wanted their girls to go to school that I met. You know, they wanted them to learn to read and write because they wanted from them to learn the Quran. So I think, you know, we think here of religion as a massive barrier, but I I've met many people, you know, who want what's good for their children, their girls, their, you know, daughters, etc. cetera. Um, whether they're able to is a different question. We have, Bill, are you? Yeah. Yeah, given all of that that you talked about in relation to you know the uh, issues that have come up, in the, all what, what do you think the chances are in terms of maybe just a percentage of actually reaching people that you'd like to reach in terms of having people become educated and so forth in all these places around the world and so forth? Um, obviously, 100% is probably a little over right. optimistic, but what? I'm, I'm a little depressed to, at this, this year about it, frankly, because we did great for the last many years, um, last decade, uh, and now the pace of growth, uh, the pace of change has slowed and we're kind of leveling off to the point where actually in, at 2015, which was the big goal for the Millennium Development Goals, we're going to have more, if, if we continue at this pace, we're going to have more kids out of school in five years than today with population growth and all that stuff. So frankly, I'm a bit depressed. We need, as this gentleman said, some radical <laughs> solutions is what we need. Thank you. Uh, let me thank you. I, these were just great questions. Mm, I'm absolutely. really impressed with you guys. Thanks uh -huh. for coming. Uh, we're going to wrap up because we're at the hour, but Rebecca will be here for mm -hmm. a few minutes to answer some questions we didn't get to. <laughs> thanks for coming. I hope we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.